And uh, thanks very much, everybody, for joining us here this evening for my talk about uh, Patrick O'Connell, um, a Dubliner who, as Emma mentioned, uh, was born and raised not far from uh, from Condor Library. And uh, that's marked now by a commemorative plaque, which you can see here. Uh, this plaque was uh, unveiled back on the 5th of June uh, 2015, so uh, over six years now since that plaque was uh, installed uh, by Dublin City Council at uh, number 87 Fitzroy uh, Avenue, which is right in the uh, shadow of Pro Park. And it was uh, unveiled by uh, Pat O'Connell's grandson, Mike, who traveled over from England, and uh, also the Dublin Central TD, Maureen O'Sullivan, and uh, in attendance on the day, as you can see here, uh, Mike O'Connell, the grandson, is a uh, second from the left, uh, and he was joined by uh, several well-known uh, retired footballers, including Steve Archibald and Bertie Ald. And uh, this was the first of what is now, I believe, 36 uh, new uh, Dublin City Council plaques that have been installed in the last six years, those uh, circular plaques uh, with the aluminium cap and the Dublin City Council logo uh, at the bottom. So the first one of this new series of plaques uh, was one honouring Patrick O'Connell. Now, uh, as with all of these new uh, Dublin City Council plaques, the uh, text on this one is very concise. Uh, it simply says in English and uh, Irish that Patrick O'Connell was a footballer and a manager who lived at Fitzroy Avenue, born in 1887 and died in 1959. So very brief and to the point text, and that's done on purpose to avoid them uh, being too cluttered. So what I would like to do this evening is flesh out uh, the story of Patrick O'Connell and discuss uh, his remarkable life and uh, what he achieved in the world of uh, football to warrant the plaque being installed in Dublin, but also other uh, commemorative uh, activities in recent years and why he's been getting uh, increased recognition uh, in the last uh, six or seven years. Now, uh, for a long time, the name of uh, Patrick O'Connell uh, was very little known in his native city and uh, Ireland more generally, uh, it has to be said, although that has been changing um, largely because of the activities of a group called the Patrick O'Connell Memorial Fund, uh, which was founded in England uh, back in uh, 2014. Now, uh, as a footballer, uh, Patrick O'Connell uh, appears uh, to have started out as a forward, uh, but uh, came back uh, down the field and uh, established himself as a halfback which is nowadays what we would call a, a centre half. So he was a defender and uh, he was around uh, five foot 11 in height and at his peak weighed about uh, 12 stone. Now he was a, a very determined player, a very uh, tenacious player it seems, right footed uh, with a very powerful shot. And among uh, some of his achievements are as a player, uh, playing and captaining Manchester United. Uh, he also, played and captained the senior uh, Irish football team. And as a manager, he had the distinction of winning La Liga championship in Spain, the Spanish fourth division uh, championship, and also managing uh, Barcelona football club uh, during the Spanish civil war, a pivotal uh, era uh, in the club's history. So a um, pretty remarkable life uh, for a Dubliner who was, in terms of his personality, said to be polite, uh, charming at times, charismatic. Uh, but he also had a, a little bit of a, a double life, as uh, we shall see. Now, I'll show you a copy of his birth certificate here, uh, which shows you that Patrick Joseph O'Connell uh, was born on the 9th of March, 1887. Uh, the handwriting, as with most of these uh, general registry office certs, is quite difficult to read, but it says here uh, that he was born at 16 Mabel Street uh, off the Clonliffe Road. Uh, his father, Patrick O'Connell as well, his mother uh, Elizabeth, whose uh, maiden name was 
Fox. And uh, Mabel Street is just right around the corner from Fitzroy Avenue, where that uh, Dublin City Council plaque is now uh, installed. Uh, his father came from Kilkenny and worked as a miller. And uh, his mother originally came from Mead. And uh, Patrick and Elizabeth would have 11 other children, as well as uh, Patrick Joseph. Uh, two of them uh, passed away, though, uh, in their infancy. So this was a, a large Catholic family. And uh, by 1899, the O'Connells were living at uh, 11 Jones's Terrace in Drumcondra. Um, we can see the 1901 census return here. We have uh, nine children listed as living in the house. I'll highlight Patrick. Uh, he was 14 years of age and had already left school and was working as a glass fitter, which I believe is somebody that would help uh, you know, um, fit glass into windows and doors. Now, I'll show you the text of that census return here. And again, highlight Patrick down the bottom. So here we have Pat Connell, 14 years of age, 1901, uh, one of the children in the family, Roman Catholic and uh, working as a, a glass fitter already at the age of uh, 14. And uh, he would later secure employment at Boland's Mill flour mill in Ringsend, uh, where his father also worked. So uh, he grew up uh, playing football uh, in Dublin, and he would play for the leading clubs of Liffey Wanderers, uh, with whom he won the Empire Cup, which was a very big uh, tournament um, for youth football in Leinster. He won that in 1904, 1905, 1906. And Pat O'Connell then played for uh, Strand Hill Juniors and won the Leinster Junior Cup in 1908. So he had a very successful career playing youth football in Dublin. Uh, and he was good enough to be able to embark on a career as a professional footballer uh, when he turned 21 years of age. Um, and rather than signing for a Dublin club like Shelburne or Shamrock Rovers or Bohemians, uh, in August 1908, he instead signed a contract with Belfast Celtic a leading Catholic and uh, nationalist team who played in the Irish Football League and uh, had been formed in 1890. Now, the timing of this move and the beginning of Patrick's professional career is uh, interesting because uh, he moved to Belfast from Dublin in August of 1908. And this was just a few months after his marriage. So here he got married on the, the 16th of May, Patrick J. O'Connell. He married uh, a woman called Ellen Treston, uh, who lived at the North Strand. And uh, you can see here uh, that he's already now at the age of uh, 21, working as a, a foreman a store clerk. So I think that would give you an indication of his leadership qualities, the fact that he was a foreman already by, by the age of uh, 21. And... Uh, the marriage took place at St. Agatha Church in Dublin on 16th of May, 1908. And just under five months later, after his marriage in Dublin and uh, moving to Belfast, uh, Patrick and Ellen celebrated first of their four children being born, Patrick O'Connell Jr., so born on the 14th of October, 1908. So perhaps, considering how conservative Ireland was at that time, uh, perhaps it was... Uh, personal reasons as well as professional, which dictated him moving to Belfast uh, after turning 21 to begin his uh, professional career. Uh, he spent just one year in Belfast, uh, and then he crossed the Irish Sea one year later in August of 1909, after securing a contract uh, with Sheffield Wednesday. And you can see a photograph here of the first team squad for the 1909-1910 uh, uh, season and Sheffield Wednesday at the time were a leading club in the English uh, first division. So this was a great opportunity for Patrick when he uh, left for England. Um, but he spent a few seasons with Sheffield Wednesday um, and was never really able to establish himself uh, in the first team, uh, as seen by the fact that he only made uh, 21 appearances. Um, and sometimes he would have to earn uh, elsewhere by uh, working in a, a local factory, which was uh, owned by 
a businessman who supported Sheffield Wednesday and indeed seemed to have uh, actually been one of the club's founders. And uh, O'Connell then circled in red, standing in the back as one of the taller players. Uh, and at this time in his life, he did not always wear a hat to uh, hide his baldness. He still had a full head of hair at uh, this time in his life. And it, it was during his time at Sheffield Wednesday that uh, O'Connell succeeded in gaining the first of his six international caps for the Irish senior team, although it was with the next club that he played for uh, in England that he would enjoy more success and establish himself uh, as an Irish international. Uh, and this was Hull City, who we joined in May 1912. Uh, Hull City were playing in the second division, so he dropped down a division, uh, joined Hull for £350 uh, and established himself in the first team and enjoyed lots of success playing for the Tigers. He had more success playing for the Tigers of Hull City uh, than the Owls of Sheffield Wednesday. And uh, he gained a taste for travel as well by going uh, to Norway and Belgium uh, on pre-season trips with Hull uh, in 1912 and 1913. Now here we can see uh, a couple of photographs of O'Connell in his uh, Hull City uh, colours, as it were, although they're black and white photos, obviously, but uh, Hull City's famous uh, black and gold striped jerseys. We can also see a 1912 cartoon there uh, at the centre, suggesting that he might have been a somewhat of a stylish player, despite playing uh, in defence. And uh, in the photograph on the right, that where he's seating, you can see that he's wearing one of his uh, Irish international caps, because uh, during this time, and indeed for a long time afterwards, when a player would play for the country, they would actually get cap. You always hear about uh, players gaining so many caps for the country. But uh, back during this era, international caps were very hard to uh, come by. So um, it was a great honour to play for your country and you would receive a cap in acknowledgement uh, of being chosen uh, to represent uh, your nation. Um, now, while he was a whole city player, Patrick O'Connell started all three of Ireland's uh, International Association Championship matches, uh, is what they were called. This was a, an international a tournament that would later become known as the Home Championship. So you would have um, Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales, and they would play each other uh, every year. So you would play three matches uh, in this tournament that happened uh, every year. And it was in 1914 that I... Ireland made history by upsetting the odds and winning this tournament outright for the only time in the history of the now uh, defunct competition and had been running for three decades. Um, Ireland had previously managed to share victory on one occasion with England and Scotland, that was in 1903, but otherwise they had a dreadful record in this uh, tournament, so they would not have been expected to finish top uh, in uh, 1914. Uh, interestingly, after Ireland uh, became the Republic of Ireland and left and was replaced by Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland uh, went on to win it uh, a couple of times. Um, but O'Connell had success then with Ireland in 1914. We'll zoom in on him here. Uh, it was a great achievement, one of the greatest achievements of his career. He played in all three uh, games, and this was before partition. So at the time, uh, people all over, our players all over Ireland were able to uh, turn out for the uh, international team uh, and the FAI or Football Association of Ireland have not been founded. So we can see here uh, one of the uh, lineups, uh, well, Connell circled in the back. And at the time, they were representing the Irish Football Association, which is based in Belfast. And that logo uh, is almost identical now to the Northern Ireland uh, logo. So uh, Ireland played three games in this tournament and on the 19th of January they, they travelled to Wrexham and managed to defeat Wales by two goals to one. Both goals were scored uh, by Sheffield United's William Gillespie who was from Donegal and had previously played for Linfield Football Club. And then the following month on Valentine's Day the remarkable 
a victory for Ireland because they hammered England 3 nil at Middlesbrough's Ayrson Park. Uh, Ireland then won 3 nil uh, Patrick O'Connell captain the side on this occasion. We have Gillespie getting another goal and also Liverpool's uh, William Lacey, who used to play for Shelburne in Dublin, uh, also getting on the score sheet. And there you can see uh, the two players uh, who got the goals in that uh, remarkable victory against England. And that meant that in the final game, uh, Ireland just had to avoid defeat against Scotland to ensure victory in the tournament. And on the 14th of March, uh, before a huge crowd at Windsor Park, uh, they secured a one-all draw against Scotland, uh, which ensured that they won the championship and it was during this match, which was played in dreadful conditions, uh, that Pat O'Connell suffered a very serious arm injury. Um, but he carried on playing. He came out for the second half, despite having a break in his arm, uh, because he didn't want Ireland to go down to nine men. This was an era when uh, there was no substitutions. So he really showed his toughness and commitment uh, to the cause. And uh, this was a wonderful victory for Ireland to, to, to win this uh, international tournament. But unfortunately, because of the outbreak of the First World War, shortly afterwards, in August 1914, uh, there will be no international association tournament for uh, five years. So Ireland were not able to defend their championship for five years. And this would not be the uh, last time that war would have a negative impact on uh, Pat O'Connell's footballing uh, career. Now, here's the team, incidentally, that lined out against Wales in the first match, January 1914. I'll zoom in on O'Connell standing at the back. And then the next month, we have the team that turned out on Valentine's Day to play against England in Middlesbrough. I'm not sure who the guy is in the suit uh, lying down in front of the team, but I can tell you that this is Patrick O'Connell standing at the back again with his arms folded. And then finally, uh, the match played at Windsor Park in Belfast against Scotland in March 1914. And again, standing in the back row with his arms folded is uh, Patrick O'Connell. And uh, so much did Patrick O'Connell impress during his time with Hull City in the English Second Division, and particularly playing for Ireland in this tournament in 1914, that he secured himself a big move and he was signed in May of uh, 1914 by Manchester United for uh, an almost record fee of £1,000, which had to be paid in uh, instalments. And we can see a cartoon here from a, a whole newspaper, and it's lamenting how Patsy O'Connell is uh, setting sail for Manchester United in the first division, and uh, the poor Tigers have been left stranded in the second division, uh, at least for a bit longer. And when he went to uh, Manchester United, uh, O'Connell was soon made captain of the club, the first Irish man to receive this uh, honour. Um, but the First World War had a, a very negative impact on his career. This was his prime um, he had just started for Ireland. Ireland had won that championship. He had secured his big move to United. Uh, but the First World War meant that he only got to make 35 appearances for the club. And because of relaxed uh, registration rules during the war, uh, he also turned out occasionally for the likes of Rochdale United and Chesterfield United during this period. And he also worked in a munitions factory. Uh, here we can see a photograph there on the right of the United uh, first team squad for 1914-15, 1914-15, and uh, I'll zoom in so we get to see O'Connell. And then in the photograph on the right, you can see him competing uh, in an aerial uh, duel there while playing for United. Now, he was evidently a bit of a, an aggressive player, uh, almost like the Irish stereotype, uh, at least in this uh, 1914 Manchester newspaper cartoon. Uh, it was claimed that he only played to the best of his ability when he was a wee bit 
angry. Although I don't believe he ever uh, actually resorted to sending opposition player, players fleeing and seeing stars by uh, swinging a bench, uh, marauding around uh, the field. But he was, however, implicated in a, a match-fixing scandal in April of 1915. So not long after he joined the club, and this is a, a pretty notorious game in uh, English footballing history, it was uh, played at Old Trafford on the 2nd of April, and United secured victory. They won against their rivals at Liverpool two goals to nil. And this was towards the end of the season. And that helped United uh, stay up in the first division by just the one point. It's been a, a difficult season for them. And uh, although he was interviewed afterwards because of all uh, the rumours abounding about players fixing uh, the outcome of the match, um, he was interviewed afterwards. And although he... Uh, missed with a farcically bad penalty kick. He was not the normal penalty kick taker, but insisted on taking a penalty kick that was said in one match report to have come closer to hitting the corner flag than the goal. Uh, he managed to escape any uh, punishment, uh, although seven other players who played that day would not be so lucky and received lifetime bans. Although most of these lifetime bans were overturned uh, due most likely to the players concerned uh, joining the British Army and uh, going off to fight in the First World War. And uh, it's worth making the point that there would have been a real strong incentive for footballers to fix a match during this time because with the war, uh, it was felt that the footballing seasons were going to be uh, suspended uh, indefinitely, which would interrupt the livelihoods of the players. Um, and with the war happening, their lives would also be put at risk. Um, so this was at 1915. Uh, so uh, ignore that 2015 on the screen. This is a uh, second of April 1915. Uh, uh, he managed to uh, escape any punishment uh, for this match fixing scandal. Uh, so the war ended finally in uh, November of uh, 1918, and not long afterwards, uh, as his career was winding down, uh, Patrick O'Connell. Uh, shortly after making his final appearance, had joined the Scottish team of Dumbarton in August 1919. Uh, he spent one season with Dumbarton uh, in Scotland, fairly uneventful, and he did some work in the local shipyard as well, but he did gain some coaching experience when he was up in uh, Scotland, and then he returned to England to play for uh, Ashington FC, uh, playing in Northumberland. This is a, a mining town where Bobby and Jack Charlton would be born. Um, and he became their player manager in 1921. But then, uh, in 1922, he suddenly decided to embark on a coaching career in Spain. And uh, he abandoned his wife and their four young children. They have four children now. Patrick uh, had been joined by Nancy, Ellen and Daniel. And uh, they were living in Manchester. Uh, where they had remained living for the previous few years. Um, so he left behind his wife and their four children in Manchester, and in 1922 emigrated to Spain. And the first that his family knew about his whereabouts uh, was apparently when he sent home some pesetas from Spain in November of 1922. And uh, the wife would continue to receive money in the post from Spain uh, for 18 months before that uh, stopped. Um, when he was in Spain, Patrick uh, O'Connell, from 1922 to 1929, he coached the team of Real Racing Club de Santander. Most people just refer to them as Racing or Santander. And this was situated on north coast Spain, uh, close to Bilbao. And when he was managing this team, the north of Spain, uh, O'Connell won seven regional trophies and he was in charge when Santander were invited to become one of the 10 founding members of La Liga, the new Spanish first division, uh, 1929. But he then left to manage uh, a nearby team called Oviedo for two seasons. And then he moved south to Seville, the city of Seville, to manage uh, Betis. Betis Ballon PA, they were called at the time. Um, beforehand, they were known as Real Betis. They would be known again as Real Batiste afterwards, after the Spanish uh, Second Republic uh, had come to an end. And uh, it was while he managed Real Batiste 
that he achieved his greatest honour because he led them to victory, their one and only victory uh, when they won La Liga Championship in 1935 and then went on to manage Barcelona, which was a, a long-held ambition of O'Connell's. So I'll just show you very quickly on maps uh, how he travelled around as a footballer. First, joining Belfast Celtic, 1908, the following year over to Sheffield, playing for Sheffield Wednesday, then Hull City a few years uh, later, 1912, and then a couple of years later, Manchester United, and then after the war, playing uh, for Dumbarton in Scotland and Ashington in Northern England, and then play becoming the coach of Santander there the, in the north of Spain, Oviedo, afterwards uh, slightly to the west, before going down to the beautiful city of Seville uh, to manage Real Betis. And then after his success there, taking up the reins at Barcelona. Um, so when he left, uh, left uh, England and left his wife and children in, in Manchester, um, he would end up getting married again in Spain. He would end up committing bigamy. And 12 years later, 1934. And what's remarkable is in 1934, when he was the manager of uh, Betis, O'Connell married a woman from Ireland who had the same name, uh, Ellen. Uh, the second wife's name was Ellen O'Callaghan. And he called her Ellie to differentiate her from uh, his first wife. And the second wife was seemingly completely unaware of the fact that he had been married and had four children. And he wrote a letter to uh, his brother, Larry, who... Uh, had moved to London after uh, deciding to get married a second time. And in this letter, he was very pragmatic. He simply wrote to his brother and said, I have met a woman called Ellie. She is Irish and she lives here in Spain working as a nanny. There cannot be above a dozen or 20 Irish women in this country. And I have met one of them and are, we are to marry. Uh, this is a somewhat unconventional approach. However, all that is past, is now past. It was a different life in a different country, and what is past is finished. Ellen, the Ellen of Den, was part of the passions of youth. She and I were ill-matched. We two touched briefly, intertwined, and separated. We will never meet again in this life. Uh, my children were cared for as much as was possible, given the distance and my resources. I did my best. And interestingly, although he abandoned her and the children, uh, Ellen O'Connell, the first wife, would never criticise uh, her husband in front of relatives or uh, friends. And in the early 1950s, uh, one of their four children, Dan, travelled to Spain, travelled to Seville to try and meet his father. And when he met uh, Patrick O'Connell, his dad, uh, the reunion did not go very well. Uh, Patrick pretended to a second wife that the man traveling over to see him uh, was actually his nephew rather than his son. And when they met for the first time in three decades, uh, Pat O'Connell began this reunion by asking his son uh, how Manchester United were faring uh, at the time. But to get back to uh, this John Condor man's uh, football and career as a coach in Spain, uh, there we can see Ellie. Uh, who he's walking with in Seville, uh, the second wife. But to uh, focus on his career in, in Spain, as a, a football manager, he was uh, someone that had a reputation for trusting in young players. And he liked his teams to transition very quickly from defence to attack rather than playing through midfield. And this was very uncommon in Spain, still is. Um, he was also very friendly with his players and liked to be hands-on on the, the training ground, which again made him somewhat different than many of the other coaches in Spain. Uh, he was friendly with his players, but he did demand that they be as fit as possible. And he was innovative um, in Spain by focusing a lot on defending and making his teams very difficult to beat. And that's clear when you look at his greatest achievement as a, a manager, when he led the very unfancied team of Betis to their first and to this date their only La Liga championship uh, during the 1934-35 season. Here we can see the Betis team and uh, other club personnel posing proudly with the La Liga championship. I'll zoom in 
on the trophy. And you can see Patrick uh, there, the man who masterminded this great victory. And, and when they won in 1934 or 35, uh, they were the second biggest club in Seville, obviously behind Seville FC. The, the ground that they played in only had 1,500 uh, people capacity. Um, but they upset the odds. And when they won the championship, Pat O'Connell was extremely proud, as you might expect. He wrote a letter to his brother Larry in London and declared, we have done it. The great FC Real Betis Ballon PA de Sevilla, or Betis to friends, uh, have won La Liga. What more can a manager want than to take his team to the very top? Every man of them deserved it. It was a great moment of triumph, a singular event. Raise your glass to us. Betis is top of La Liga of Spain. And uh, you can see there in the photograph on the left, him wearing that hat that he was uh, known for in Spain. And apparently uh, he did it to try and uh, hide his baldness, which he felt self-conscious about. Now, during his first season at Betis, uh, O'Connell managed to get them promoted to the first division. Uh, so that was 1932, shortly after he took over. Uh, the previous year, they'd finished mid-table in the second division. So he managed to get them promoted. And then within three years, uh, they finished ahead of Madrid CF uh, beforehand and later to become known again as Real Madrid. And it was a remarkable season they conceded just 19 goals and when you look at the table for that season the final league table it really demonstrates how a strong defense was crucial for Betis's uh, triumph um when they conceded 19 goals that was 15 less than any other team and uh, Madrid in second place came closest they conceded 34 goals so 15 fewer goals than uh, Madrid or any other team so even though the teams that finished in second third fourth fifth and sixth all uh, scored more goals than betty's nobody came close to conceding as few goals as patrick o'connell's team and that's why they were able to finish on top after 22 games with 34 points so this was when you had two points for a victory one point for a draw so uh, out of those uh, 22 games there you have 15 wins four draws and only three losses and uh, recognizing the fact that he led them to this historic victory in their stadium museum, Real Betis have this bronze bust of Pat O'Connell, uh, known among other things as Don Patricio during his time in Spain. And this was donated back in 2017. And uh, it was created by an artist from Dublin, from East Wall, uh, Dublin Tree, a man called Joe Moran who has uh, art or permanent sculptures in Fairview Park and in uh, Rings End. And uh, in Joe's home in Eastwall, he still has uh, the clay model of the bust of O'Connell that he created. It's uh, on one of his bookcases beside bronze busts of uh, James Connolly and Luke Kelly, and also his late wife, Anne uh, Moran. Um, now here you can see the relevant section of the Betis Stadium Museum. They have a replica of the La Liga Championship there at the center, the bust of O'Connell on the left. And then there's also uh, a slate portrait of O'Connell uh, that's been done by a Manchester artist named Tony Denton. And that's also been donated to uh, the museum. And the slogan on the wall, incidentally, at the back uh, is very interesting because that roughly translates as more when we lose. And uh, Real Baptiste are a, a team that have a fanatical support and they take pride in the fact that they're not a very successful team. So they like to sing about how they support the team even more when they lose. They don't follow them just because they're successful. They follow them because uh, they're passionate about supporting their uh, local team. And uh, close to the stadium in a park in Seville, there's this sculpture uh, immortalizing the team all the different players are listed there uh, who won this championship back in 1945. And at the very bottom, they spell his surname wrong with only one N, but you have their uh, on trainador O'Connell, uh, manager or trainer uh, O'Connell. Now, as a result of this remarkable victory 
uh, in La Liga with the unfancied team of Betis. Uh, Patrick O'Connell was able to finally get the job that he'd wanted for years, uh, becoming the manager of FC Barcelona. Uh, this was way before they became the big giants of European football that played uh, in Camp Nou or the New Camp. But it was a big job and it was one that he really was excited about. Um, he felt that the players for Barcelona were good enough to win La Liga within two seasons. So that was the goal he set himself, of winning La Liga within two years. Um, unfortunately, however, things did not work out as planned. And again, it's for reasons that had nothing to do with uh, football. Um, during his time in charge of Barca, uh, O'Connell did enjoy some success. They re reached the final of the Spanish Cup in 1936, but lost to Madrid 2-1. Uh, and they also won uh, a competition called the Mediterranean League and had been set up for uh, teams that played in the Republican area of Spain. So this was set up because of the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, which ran from 1936 to 39. And the Civil War jeopardized Barcelona's very existence. Uh, the club's president, uh, who had hired Pat Connell as a manager, uh, a man called Jose Sunyul, he was assassinated in August 1906. The Barcelona uh, sports ground was damaged during a bombing attack. And O'Connell and his players had to agree to take a very significant uh, pay cut uh, at the time. So Barcelona was in real trouble uh, during the Spanish Civil War. And rather than resigning, and going back to England or Ireland, which the club had uh, assumed might happen, uh, O'Connell decided to stay on as the manager, and he agreed to take the club on a tour of uh, New York, Mexico, and Cuba in 1937. Uh, Barcelona went on this four-month tour uh, as what was, they were called Ambassadors of the Republic and the Catalans. And during this four-month trip to the Americas, Barcelona raised $12,500, which was deposited in a bank in Europe. And that this money helped save the club from financial ruin and slowly begin to rebuild uh, once the Civil War was over. And O'Connell was very proud of the tour that he had uh, led. It, he felt that it was very important for ordinary people in Catalonia to have a football club that they could uh, lose themselves in um, following. Uh, he wrote to his brother, that they can continue to lose themselves in escapism. The great FC Barcelona will fight another day. And it's a story, this tour uh, of the Americas in 1937 from May to October. Yeah, it's a story that really exemplifies the notion of uh, Barcelona being more than just uh, a football club, Mesque un club. And uh, it was this achievement of Pat O'Connell helping to uh, rescue the club from financial ruin during the Spanish Civil War, which has inspired the title of this book, you can see here, uh, written by Sue O'Connell. Uh, she's the wife of uh, Patrick's grandson, Mike, and they both were there for the uh, plaque unveiling in Vincondra. We saw at the beginning of the presentation, we saw a photograph of uh, Sue's husband, Mike, there. And this was published back in 2016, and the title chosen was The Man Who Saved FC Barcelona. Um, here we can see the Barcelona traveling party in 1937. And that most of these, uh, the players anyway, would stay on either in America or South America or in Europe and not travel back to uh, Catalonia. Um, I'll zoom in on O'Connell here. And you can also see a, a Mexican newspaper extract from 1937. And uh, although he was only 50 years of age, O'Connell was described as a un viejo lobo del fútbol, uh, an old footballing wolf. Uh, I'm sure they meant it as a, a compliment. So O'Connell may have enjoyed more success with Betis uh, winning that La Liga championship. Uh, but when you, you play an important role in helping save a football club that has gone on to become one of the biggest football clubs uh, in the world, it's inevitable. Uh, that he's become in some way uh, better known for his uh, spell in charge of Barca during the Spanish Civil War and the remarkable success he had uh, with Betis in the uh, few years previously. And incidentally, when he left Europe to go on that four-month tour, his second wife was pregnant 
at the time, uh, but she would lose the baby uh, while he was uh, overseas and he did not learn about uh, her miscarriage until they reunited in London uh, a couple of years later. So um, he was in charge of Barcelona then for a while. Then he would uh, go back to uh, Betis and then he would even coach their arch rivals, Seville, uh, before returning to the north of Spain. And he managed that Santander in the 40s as well and managed to get them promoted from the third to the second division. Um, and by the early 1950s, he had become viewed as a, an outdated coach, somewhat old fashioned. So he had to start working in the early 50s as a, a footballing scout. And income was a problem. Um, and by 1955, he decided it was time to uh, bid farewell to Spain and uh, move to London. So uh, Pat O'Connell and his second wife decided to uh, go back over uh, to London. And uh, he was very sad. He told his brother that he had assumed that he would stay in, in the city of Seville for the rest of his life. Uh, he loved the city. He loved the lifestyle there. Um, he loved the passion of people, not just for their football, but also for the way they lived their lives. And uh, he wrote a letter saying to his brother that he was proud of the fact that he had made no little mark on the world of football here in Spain. Uh, the game in Spain would not be where it is today without my contribution. So we yeah, are very proud when he, he looked back at the career that he had had as a, a manager. Now, the last sort of chapter in the Path of Connell story is unfortunately marked by sadness. Uh, the relationship with his second wife came to an end in London, uh, seemingly after she, after she finally discovered the fact that he had a, a double life, that he actually had a, a wife already and four children. Um, and he spent his final years in England living destitute, uh, living in his brother's attic and claiming national assistance just to uh, make ends meet. Uh, he passed away in a London hospital, St. Pancreas Hospital, uh, from pneumonia on the 27th of February, uh, 1959. He was aged 71 and was buried in a pauper's grave, uh, St. Mary's Catholic Cemetery the following week, just a few days before his 72nd birthday. And uh, due to the efforts of the Path O'Connell Memorial Fund, that I mentioned earlier, uh, founded in uh, 2014. Uh, due to the efforts of that group, uh, a gravestone has been secured. Uh, you see there, and uh, I'll zoom in on the text. And as you can see, it says just very simply that Pat Joseph O'Connell uh, is remembered by many in Ireland, England, and Spain. And certainly recognition of his life uh, and his sporting achievements uh, have been growing in recent years, as well as the plaque in Drumcondra. There is also another plaque in Belfast, you can see here, uh, a blue Ulster History Circle plaque, and that's located beside a cafe at Albert Street. Uh, so where he lived uh, during that season, he spent with uh, Belfast Celtic before going over to England. And elsewhere in Belfast, there's uh, this very striking and colourful street mural uh, just located off the Falls Road, West Belfast, honouring the footballing life of uh, O'Connell and uh, Leo Messi, of all people, there in the centre. Uh, there's lots of little details in this mural, but uh, I'll just zoom in on the text on the top. You can see there, Pat O'Connell, Don Patricio, from Celtic Park to Barcelona. And it is as the, the manager of FC Barcelona that O'Connell appears over on the right side of the artwork. On the left side, you have him uh, wearing a Belfast Celtic uh, jersey, celebrating a goal. And on the other side, then you have him as a manager. And he's reading a newspaper here uh, about the civil war erupting in Spain and the assassination of the FC Barcelona president who had brought him to Catalonia. Now, if you would like to learn more about Pat O'Connell's uh, life, there are a couple of documentaries you can watch online, uh, including the most recent one here is a 2018 production called Don Patricio, and you can either buy a copy or rent it for one month at this website, donpatricio.tv. And also, uh, just before Christmas, 
there is a book uh, due to be published by Dublin City Council. It's a volume four of the History on Your Doorstep book of essays, which comes out every year. And uh, we're hoping that it gets published in December. And this is a free publication that uh, is circulated to all uh, Dublin City branch libraries, so including from Condra. And uh, I'm contributing an essay here in this particular volume about the life of Patrick O'Connell. So there's usually, I think, 5,000 copies of this book uh, published, and then they get circulated to the different library branches, and you can pick up a copy completely for free, and then they're also made available to download online. You can download the first three volumes of this History in a Doorstep collection uh, on the DublinCity.ie uh, website. Um, so when you look at uh, Patrick O'Connell's life, just to, to sum up, this is a man who left Drumcondra when he turned 21 years of age, started his career up in Belfast and then went on to play for some very big clubs in England uh, and become the first of four Irish men to captain Manchester uh, United. He was an important player when Ireland achieved that remarkable victory in 1914, finishing ahead of Scotland uh, and England and Wales and winning uh, the International Association Championship. And then as a manager, he actually won La Liga Championship with a completely unfancied team and was manager of FC Barcelona at a crucial time in their history. The club could have very easily gone out of existence uh, during the Spanish Civil War. So when you look at his achievements as a football player and as a football manager, I think uh, he's done more than enough to justify having a, a plaque at Fitzroy Avenue uh, commemorating uh, the fact that he uh, lived there. And I can't help but sort of wonder just what might have happened had it not been for the First World War, uh, cutting short his playing career when he was at his real prime. He had just signed for Manchester United. He had been made captain of Manchester United. He had just starred for Ireland, winning this tournament for the first time in their history. So as a player, the First World War really had a very negative impact when he was at his peak. And then as a manager, he achieved success with a few different clubs and then led Betis to their historic victory in 1934-35. And then the Spanish Civil War steps in to really impact negatively on him having that dream job uh, in charge of FC Barcelona. And then when the Spanish Civil War comes to an end, you have the Second World War again, really uh, throwing a spanner in the works and impacting and interrupting uh, his career as a coach. And then, you know, he would begin to uh, be looked upon as uh, outdated. So you can't help but wonder what would have happened and what else would he have achieved as both a player and a manager had it not been for the First World War, Second World War and uh, the Spanish Civil War. And maybe if those various wars had not happened and he had been able to fully fulfill his potential as a player and as a manager, uh, he might have been able to achieve even more. And then uh, the name of Patrick O'Connell uh, would not have been so uh, unfairly overlooked in his native city and Ireland for so many years. So I'll wrap things up there. So I'll say thank you very much for your time. And any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to uh, type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Thanks very much. Thanks a million, James. Um, that was uh, fantastic as always. And um, yeah, I just know from working in the branch, we're open at the moment in Drumcondra and um, he's not as well known as he really should be. And that's why we decided to, to give the talk on him. And actually earlier on in uh, the, the um, presentation, um, uh, there was a comment from um, uh, a participant in Limerick and they were saying, I was amazed I wasn't aware of him but then realised you meant soccer instead of football. <laughs> then I realised you're talking about Don Patricio. Now I have to, I have to admit that was probably me at the start of the presentation. Um, and I'm actually more of a, a GAA supporter and I get given out all the time um, by my colleagues in work for saying uh, soccer when I'm not referring to, to Dublin. So there you go. Um, and well done, Limerick as well, and we're winning the hurling this year. So Jerry has a question. Uh, well, he pointed out something, and uh, Jerry's actually that's timely for me because Jerry Farrell is giving our next uh, Dublin Festival of History talk 
Um, it's a short history of Drumcondra FC and it's on uh, Tuesday, the 5th of October at 7 p.m. So um, if you wanted to book for that, you'd be very welcome. And possibly also just to comment that, um, you know, we went with these two talks because it's 100 years of the League of Ireland and there hasn't been a lot really to commemorate it. So I thought it was very important um, being cited in Drumcondra, which is a a half head and uh, really legendary in terms of the teams that were surrounding us and also I suppose we're at the crossroads of, of Talca and Daily Mount. But anyway, Jerry uh, is just pointing out that photograph that you were talking about there from Old Trafford uh, from 1915 and he's just wondering if the lad lying on the ground in, in that photo is Robert Norwood of Belfast Celtic. Yeah, um, I was I so, saying that, let's say, I presume that that's the um... Valentine's Day 1914 game against England in Middlesbrough and there's that guy in the suit lying oh, down almost like he's posing to be painted in there, the Titanic movie. Well that's a wonderful suggestion, thanks very much Jerry. I'll have to look that up and hopefully you're right, it'd be wonderful to be able to put a name uh, to that person in front of the, the photograph. That's something to uh, to investigate, thanks very much. And I see also oh. Visit West Limerick has mentioned about the uh, Celtic Park surviving until 1986 as a Greyhound racing ground and uh, their records are now held as solitude. But thanks very much for that, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. So Sean is wondering, is the Empire Cup available to view from the FAI in Abbottstown? I don't know if you know the answer to that. I'm not sure, I think so because I know there was, um, and it's still there, I know there was a display, like a little section of their uh, museum dedicated to Patrick O'Connell and I believe, I know there is was a trophy in it anyway, but because of COVID I wasn't able, that was one of the things I wanted to do, as well as traveling to Seville and go to the Betis Museum, but unfortunately COVID has ruined everything. But I believe that uh, there was an Empire Cup in that Patrick O'Connell cabinet and there's a, it, there's a paint, like a, an artwork of it in that Belfast mural. Uh, in West Belfast by the uh, the local artist Danny Devaney. So I can't say for 100%, but I think so would be my answer to, to that question. Keen is wondering, would you know what county O'Connell's second wife was from? Cork. Um, and actually there was, they were, they were interested in the idea of moving to Cork uh, or going to the west of Ireland when he retired but uh, they decided not to and it was interesting when one of his letters to his brother he said uh, I fear if we move to Ireland uh, some people from Manchester will make our lives very uh, difficult so um, no so yeah but his wife was from uh, Cork the second wife Ellie number two as opposed to Ellen number one um, and Sean has mentioned about the Empire Cup being handed it in. Okay, that's something again to investigate. Thanks very much. Uh, and then Alan's just wondering, was it a coincidence that uh, Real played in green and white or did Patrick O'Connell have any influence on the strip? Well, let's say I don't think he had any influence, but there is a suggestion that the reason that they wore that those colours was because they were influenced by Glasgow Celtic. Um, now, again, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think it's one of those sort of uh, unproven stories. But I know like Bet Real Betis played Celtic just recently in the Europa League, an incredible game, just was it last week that they played. But I know a few years ago they had a sort of a, a presentation before a game between the two clubs sort of celebrating the fact that there was a historic link. So I believe the colours were um, influenced by Glasgow Celtic in the same way uh, Belfast Celtic were heavily influenced by their Glasgow um, counterparts. That's why they also wore the, the green and white stripes. Um, I see Liam's asking about did he speak Spanish? No, apparently no. Apparently he didn't have a word of Spanish when he uh, travelled. And he assumed all of Spain was really hot. But when he ended up in Santander to take up the coaching job there, uh, he was surprised to find out that it was freezing. Um, it wasn't until he got to the south of Spain that he really enjoyed, began to enjoy the the weather. So, yeah, no, he couldn't speak any Spanish, but he managed to pick up enough Spanish to survive 
and uh, apparently he, he just he loved the lifestyle in Spain. He was really happy over there, particularly in Seville. As you can imagine, anybody that's ever been to the city of Seville or Malaga or the south of Spain will know what it's like over there. But um, apparently he loved the culture. He loved eating out. He loved drinking wine, uh, perhaps too much. Uh, he did have a reputation for enjoying uh, a drink, but still being a very good professional uh, who demanded that his, his teams be as fit as possible. And uh, as I mentioned before, he would get on the training ground and actually uh, take part in training sessions. So he was just somebody that did enjoy a drink like so many other uh, Irish people. So Stephen is wondering, Stephen says that a uh, very enjoyable talk. Um, I hope Liffy Wanderers know of their famous son, Great Club and Rings End. Oh yes, they do very much. Uh, a real sort of proud, tough uh, Dublin team. And in that documentary I mentioned, the, um, the Don Patrice documentary, and I think there's also another documentary that you can watch. It was done by TG4, it's on YouTube. It's not the greatest digital quality, but uh, I think it's in the second documentary you get to see but there's also a reference in the first one that you get to see um, Liffey uh, Wanderers supporters in the pub singing um, some of their, their club's songs. So you know, they're, they're very aware of the fact that uh, one of their sons went on to play for Manchester United, play for Ireland and have such an extraordinary career as a manager over in Spain. Because it's remarkable to think, you'd imagine that somebody that achieved what he did would be better know because like for Real Betis to win La Liga, this is like Leicester City one of the Premier League, you know, not so long ago. This is one of those things that doesn't happen. And the fact that he had that success and that he then was crucial in making sure that Barcelona stayed in existence, um, even ignoring what he had done as a player and having that historic victory with Ireland in 1914. And even just looking at it, his footballing career playing for Manchester United and so on. Just when you look at those two achievements of winning La Liga and then becoming the coach of Barcelona and helping to keep them in existence, it's remarkable almost that he's he was so forgotten. Um, and even in the, the, the Don Patricia documentary, they talked to people like Martin O'Neill, Niall Quinn, and they all said the same thing. They'd never heard of him. Never heard of him. And it was only really, what happened was there was um, his grandson, Mike, gave a talk in Northumberland back in 2014, that a, a few football fans were there and they decided that they couldn't believe the story they were here and they decided to set up the Pat O'Connell Memorial Fund to try and get a gravestone um, in London so he could have a proper burial, a proper resting place. But uh, that would then sort of develop into the campaign to get a plaque in Dublin, a plaque in Belfast and donate that sculpture, which was commissioned to the Betis uh, Museum and various other things. There was also an exhibition in Pear Street Library, uh, I think in late 2017. So it's really only in the last sort of six, seven years that he's begun to get uh, recognised. And that's why I was delighted to get a chance to give this talk tonight to try and again help spread the word about him and encourage people to go off and learn more. Because uh, when you look at his career, he definitely is somebody that deserves uh, to be known by uh, Irish football fans more than he um, he is at present.